I am tired of work. I am tired of building up somebody else's civilization. Let us take a rest, Melissa Jane. I will go down to the Last Chance Saloon, drink a gallon or two of gin, shoot a game or two of dice, and sleep the rest of the night on one of Mike's barrels. You will let the old shanty go to rot, the white people's clothes turn to dust, and the Calvary Baptist Church sink to the bottomless pit. You will spend your days forgetting you married me and your nights hunting the warm gin Mike serves the ladies in the rear of the Last Chance Saloon. Throw the children into the river. Civilization has given us too many. It is better to die than it is to grow up and find out that you are colored. Pluck the stars out of the heavens. The stars mark our destiny. The stars marked my destiny. I am tired of civilization. Hello and welcome to Words That Burn, a podcast about poetry. Each week I read a poem, look at its inner workings, and hopefully show you what makes it tick. This week's poem is Tired by Fenton Johnson. Before I begin, I have a suggestion. Try to find a copy of the poem somewhere so that you can read along. You'll find a link to this one below in the description. Fenton Johnson could be looked upon as one of the most tragic figures of the Harlem Renaissance. His contribution to the movement is often overlooked, perhaps because much of his earlier work read more like a strange parody of the English lakeside poets than modern verse. His poetry is filled with overly ornate language and grand statements, a style which jarred with the modern sentiment of the late 1800s and early 20th century in which he wrote. However, his later work, this poem chief among them, would go on to influence countless other black voices like Gwendolyn Brooks and Langston Hughes. There are two things which are key in the understanding of his poem. First is Fenton Johnson's upbringing, and second is the Harlem Renaissance in general. Fenton Johnson was born in 1888 in Chicago, Illinois. He was born to a comparatively well-off African-American family for the time. That is to say that his family was as wealthy as an oppressive society would allow people of color to be at that time. As such, he was educated from a young age and enjoyed certain luxuries that were not afforded to his contemporaries. He showed an inclination towards literature from an early age, but did not pursue it fully until he was older. With his rare access to opportunity came a kind of identity crisis for Johnson. He aimed himself down many career paths, from clergyman to author to politician, often switching ambition before one had full chance to take root in his mind. This search for identity and place would parallel the goal of one of the most significant literary movements of the 20th century, the Harlem Renaissance. To call it a literary movement would be unfair. It was more akin to a cultural shift or new way of thinking. Between 1915 and 1970, The United States bore witness to an event that would become known as the Great Migration. Black families in America's South were faced with a choice. Stay in a society bound to a fierce caste system that would only ever see them as inferior and less than, or pick up and search for a new life in the North. Really, it was no choice at all. Scholar Emma J. Scott wrote, They left as though they were fleeing some curse. They were willing to make almost any sacrifice to obtain a railroad ticket. And they left with the intention of staying. Never before had African Americans congregated together in such large, concentrated numbers. They came to major cities like Chicago and New York and settled there. 
What they left behind them was the former identity of black Americans. As slaves, as property, as little more than cattle in the eyes of the white people of the South. What they came to find was another lack of clear identity. Enter the Harlem Renaissance, a collection of black voices and visions, all clamouring to define the black experience for this new age. The academic Francis Richardson Keller wrote, The Harlem literary renaissance of the 1920s was a quest for an image. It was a search for an adequate sustaining model of the kind of American the Negro might become. It was a desperate effort to fill a socio-psychological vacuum in the area of race relations in America's cities. For 20th century America, the quest was critical. Its failure is the tragedy of America. That quest for an image of which she speaks came in so many different forms during the Harlem Renaissance. Some sought to harness and reflect their new urban environment. Some hoped to present an African-American utopia. Others longed for a return to African spiritualism and ritual. Unfortunately, with so many visions put forward, there was a struggle for a single clear voice to emerge. This seems a tragic and exhausting outcome in itself, and it would appear that Fenton Johnson's poem reflects that in some way. Johnson himself was at the centre of much of the literary renaissance, both in Harlem and Chicago. He was the founder and editor of The Champion, a magazine championing black causes and ideas. His family connections found him well situated in Chicago society, and he had a good relationship with many of the prominent black voices of his time. Despite these affluent beginnings, Johnson struggled to make his mark on the literary scene, either as a magazine editor or as a poet. As previously mentioned, he is one of the more obscure figures of the Harlem Renaissance. In fact, by the time this poem was written, 1919, Johnson had largely retreated from literary life, and it was argued that the racially charged tension of post-World War I America intimidated him massively. He had, after all, been a huge advocate for the so-called reconciliation of races, the hope that all races could exist peacefully in America. Such a notion seemed ridiculous in the wake of the Great War. Perhaps it is his disillusionment that dictates the pessimistic tone of the poem. It is made so clear in those first lines. I am tired of work. I am tired of building up somebody else's civilization. Let us take a rest, Melissa Jane. His speaker is simply exhausted and cannot go on. The civilization building he references alludes to so many things on so many levels. On the one hand, it is a reference to the enslavement of his own ancestors and even the generations just before him and the back-breaking work they were forced to do to make other men rich, to build another group's society. The exploitation of their labor led to the building of a mockery of what a civilized society should be in the South. This civilization leaves a bitter taste in Johnson's mouth. On the other hand, he could be referencing his own literary efforts, those that tried to give the black experience and its people a voice. He and many of his peers had been attempting to found their own civilization, to carve out an identity for black people in the 20th century. Many people craved this new identity, a new way to exist from the 1900s onwards. And yet, in this too, Johnson has failed. Through all his literary efforts, from poetry to short stories to magazine editing, he was often shunned as simply mediocre or lacking in any real talent. In the face of so much rejection and criticism, how could he not be tired? 
the civilization he and the Harlem Renaissance strove for was never fully realized. And so that great work simply wore them down. In the following line, let us take rest, Melissa Jane. A scene is being set. The line itself is an attempt by Johnson to capture the real dialect of black people in urban settings at that time. This obsession with dialect was nothing new for Johnson, but it was one of his first attempts at capturing the urban accent that had been developed by African Americans in their mass migration. His effort in that regard, alongside the fact that the poem was written in free verse, marked him out as a rather unique poet in the Renaissance up until that point. Many believe that the experimental forms of Johnson's work paved the way for poets like Langston Hughes to really shine. In the next section, that scene is set in full. I will go down to the last chance saloon, drink a gallon or two of gin, shoot a game or two of dice, and sleep the rest of the night on one of Mike's barrels. You will let the old shanty go to rot, the white people's clothes turn to dust, and the Calvary Baptist Church sink to the bottomless pit. You will spend your days forgetting you married me, and your nights hunting the warm gin Mike serves the ladies in the rear of the Last Chance Saloon. Here, a whole lifetime is wearily laid out, or rather, laid bare. The poem turns distinctly working class, as it outlines a tragic kind of existence, one filled with alcoholism and bad luck. It is raw and unflinching. The depiction does not seek to hide the difficulties that African Americans faced in this new century. Rather, it unblinkingly watches as two terrible lives intertwine and fizzle. The speaker talks of the Last Chance Saloon, which at first may seem like the name of the bar, but was in fact a type of bar found littered across America. They were typically bars that were situated outside Prohibition counties and were a literal reminder to patrons that this was their last chance to drink before entering a dry area. The phrase then entered into popular English as an idiom denoting being one step away from completely out of luck. The picture painted by Johnson is a bleak one. Gambling and loss are all the speaker expects of his own evening, and it seems even worse for his partner. The shanty or roughly built home they've cobbled together will rot. The white people's clothes turn to dust could reference his partner's day job as a washerwoman, one that she will no longer attend to diligently. The Calvary Baptist Church that will fall to the bottomless pit is perhaps Johnson's way of critiquing the heavy reliance on religion that many African Americans took. There is no salvation in religion for Johnson. It will not help black people form a new identity. Not even their marriage is a happy one. The speaker freely admits that she will spend her days trying to erase their marriage from her mind. Destitute does not even begin to cover this bleak image. The poem's crushing pessimism is often remarked upon by critics. The poet and anthologist James Weldon Johnson once wrote of Tired and the collection that it came from that there is nothing left to fight or even hope for. These poems of despair possess tremendous power and constitute Fenton Johnson's best work. One might wonder then what the point of such a poem even is. But then, Weldon Johnson would go on to write about how using free form allowed Fenton Johnson to adopt a kind of formlessness, one which mimicked many people of color's experience. He wrote that this new style voiced the disillusionment and bitterness of feeling the Negro race was then experiencing. This poem then is less about analogy or metaphor or hope and far more about documenting the pain of the people. That sentiment is expressed starkly in the next two lines. Throw the children into the river. Civilization has given us too many. It is better to die 
than it is to grow up and find out that you are coloured. Here, death is preferable to being a person of colour. It is treated as a curse of sorts by Johnson. Civilization has given us too many, speaks once more of that pressure to build. This time, however, to build families and communities. Johnson's speaker wonders how he could look children in the eye and tell them what awaits them purely as a result of the colour of their skin. The final lines of the poem are where Johnson seems to enter the poem fully. He inhabits the body of his speaker as he says, Pluck the stars out of the heavens. The stars mark our destiny. The stars marked my destiny. I am tired of civilization. He sees no more hope in the destiny of his people. There is at least for him no bright future guaranteed, in which case he would rather see their course obscured, have that fate wiped away altogether, than to see them suffer more. He moves to the past tense to say, the stars marked my destiny. To my mind, Johnson is remarking on his own failed lofty ambitions. He is looking at his past attempts at societal and literary success and recognizing them now as failures. His destiny, the grand one he envisioned, never came to be. It is an embittered admission, but one he is not alone in. It echoes the feelings of thousands of other African Americans. Under the weight of all this, Johnson simply submits and says, I am tired of civilization. It is similar to the very beginning of the poem, but this time, it is not the task he is tired of, but civilization itself. This is true fatalism. Fenton Johnson has looked at the society he finds himself in and found it wanting. It is not just one action, building, which will exhaust him, but the system itself. It is unfair, unrelenting, and seemingly without end. More than that, it's hard to see how his final words could fail to resonate with that same community today. So why this poem? It is a piece of pure weight and power for me. It delivers a crushing message and yet carries a poignancy with it that cannot be denied. Whilst it was written about the black experience, the weariness of it is something I think many people would connect to today. Despite that, to deny its intent as a racial commentary and more importantly, a testament to the black experience would be a great injustice. This poem, canna, this poem cannot be separated from its time and context. It is a document of the difficulty and hardship his people faced. One a modern reader may bristle at today in their realizing of how little has really changed. The unfairness that Fenton Johnson writes of, that sheer giving up and loss of hope, is undoubtedly still felt by thousands of people of colour around the globe, faced with their own unfair civilizations. There is little hope to be found here, other than the fact that in time, Fenton Johnson has received his due. While it's not a prominent figure of the Harlem Renaissance in his time, or even directly after, history has come to recognise the huge contribution he made in paving the way for other black voices to come forward. We can only hope that such recognition is coming from many others, sooner rather than later. What's your reading of the poem? I'd like to point out, as always, that this is my interpretation, and as such, very much up for debate. If you'd like to talk to me about it, or if you have thoughts on it, you can reach me in a few ways. Send me an email at wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com. You can find my website, www.wordsthatburnpodcast.com. 
where you'll also find the show notes for this episode with references to all the direct quotes used here. If none of that suits you, I'm on Instagram. Just search Words That Burn Podcast. And there you can find helpful study guides and bonus content. This episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music of this week's episode is by Kai Engel and is used under Creative Commons license. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider giving me a review on whatever platform you listen on. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to me, and hopefully you'll hear from me again soon.